Hey everyone, I'm John Lee. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new, welcome. All right, so today we're going to talk a little bit about Minari, but I don't really want to talk about the movie as if I'm going to give a review of the movie. I think a lot of people have already given their reviews of the movie itself. I think you can find that on many other YouTube channels on your own. Instead of giving a movie review, what I do want to talk about is how Minari is uh, really quite an honest and unique immigrant story, which might not really speak to everyone. The first thing that I want to get out of the way is that there is no such thing as a monolithic immigrant story. Depending on where you came from or where you ended up or when this all happened, your immigrant story, if you were ever an immigrant, is going to be unique. It's going to be different from other people's. I was an immigrant for most of my life before I moved to Korea. And the story that I saw on Minari did not really reflect exactly what my immigrant experience was like. And this is why I want to talk a bit more carefully about this topic. And that's because Minari is essentially about a Korean American story, or at the very least, a Korean family that's trying to pursue the American dream. And the Korean American experience is not something that I'm altogether familiar with. Yes, I did live a few years in America when I went to college, but that was about it. I only went there for college and I was ensconced from the Korean American community in a very small and predominantly white college town. Uh, I know nothing about the Korean American experience. But although I just said that the immigrant experience is quite different, I do believe that there are going to be some parallels that most other immigrants are going to be able to recognize when they watch Minari. Now, for those of you who don't speak the Korean language, you might have missed that the title, Minari itself, actually gives away a lot about what you are going to witness while you watch this movie. Now, Minari is actually a type of uh, vegetable. I don't know if weed is the correct word, but I used to describe Minari as a weed quite often. And Minari is actually a very hardy plant. Now, uh, it can... I call it a hardy plant because Minari can grow practically anywhere. All it needs is water and soil. And in Korean markets, you can buy Minari for cheap because they are just so abundantly grown. And so because we know what the kind of vegetable Minari is, it's hardy, it's sturdy, it can live anywhere, it's strong, and it's not exactly an elite food, it's cheap, and so it kind of represents the every man or every woman. And so because of the symbolism that we already know from the plant, we know what kind of a story that there's going to be. It's going to be about a family that needs to survive and eventually does survive because Minari is hardy and sturdy, but it's going to be a lot of heartache and hardship along the way. Now, as I said, the story that was in Minari did not really reflect my family's immigrant story, but there were enough similarities that made me curious as to the director's age. So I looked it up and it looked like um, Lee Isaac Tong was born in 1978, and so he's just a few years older than me. And so although he's a few years older than me, because he's not that much older, his family and my family started out with probably similar socioeconomic backgrounds before our family started our respective immigrant stories. Now, personally, I didn't relate all that much to Steven Yeun's character. I'm not at all saying that Steven Yeun wasn't convincing. I think he killed the role. Rather, it's because the father figure that he portrayed on screen was not anything like the father figure that I grew up with. That being said, I did relate quite a lot to Han Yeri and to Yoon Yeo Jung. And Han Yeri is Steven Yeun's character's wife, and Yoon Yeo Jung is Han Yeri's character's mother. Now, the story takes place in the 1980s, and we know this because one of the side characters mentions that Ronald Reagan is president. Now, what that means is that Han Yeri's character was born sometime in the 1950s, and because of the time and the place that she was born, Han Yeri's character is representative of a certain generation of Korean women, and Yoon Yeo Jung, of course, being representative of her generation of Korean women, which might not really be all that relatable to, you know, just any other Korean woman. I think it's really a byproduct of the time that they were born and they were raised. For example, the very first time that we see Han Yeri's character, it's right at the beginning of the movie, it's when the whole family has just moved to Arkansas, and the whole family just moved to this... Uh, was essentially a trailer home with wheels that doesn't really move and Han Yeri just walks into this house and she's just disappointed you can tell from her face and Han Yeri does a lot of acting with her face in this movie and just acting with your facial expressions I cannot imagine that that's easy but she kills it and when she sees this house for the very first time you can tell that 
inner heart, inner mind, there is disappointment and heartache. And the first thing that she says to her husband, I don't know if it's the first thing or one of the earliest things that she says, is that this house that they moved into is not the house that Stephen Young's character promised that uh, she, uh, they would move into. It's not the American dream that she had hoped for. And so you can see this palpable disappointment in her face. I don't know if it's representative of all Korean women from the time or if it's just the way that she was raised, but she represented the kind of a silently suffering woman character. Now, as I saw Han Yeri's character on screen, she definitely reminded me a lot of my mother. My mother was also a young woman in her early 30s when she first emigrated to Brunei. And prior to moving to Brunei, the vision or this hope that my mother had of what life would be like living in a foreign country outside of Korea was nothing like what waited for her in reality. Uh, her dreams were also quite, I want to say, dashed perhaps when she first moved to Brunei. And, but my mother was also part of that generation who did not really speak out against her husband. She didn't really offer that many words of protest. She was one of those women who had to... Uh, who felt that she had to stay quiet in order for the family to live in peace, for the children to grow up more happily than she would uh, be able to if she had started raising a voice and started fighting. Again, part of that generation or also just part of that upbringing, perhaps. But a lot of what Han Yeri did on screen was like the mother that I grew up with. And so I felt for Han Yeri's character a lot as I watched this movie. But much more than Han Yeri, it was Yoon Yo Jung's character that really got to me. The grandmother that she portrayed on screen was really reminiscent of my both my maternal and paternal grandmother. Now, one of the things that really got to me was at the very first time when Yoon Yo Jung's character appears on screen, she brings this whole bag of food for uh, her daughter. And as her daughter opens the bag, they find Korean anchovies and gochukaru, which is a uh, Korean chili powder. And as soon as she sees this, Han Yeri starts crying. And this really reminded me of the few times when my family and I visited Korea during the holidays. Anytime we visited Korea during the holidays, my parents would always bring back these huge bags of kimchi or gochukaru all the way back to Brunei because these things were just not accessible in Brunei at the time. And I'm sure that they were not accessible in America either. Now today, Korean food has gotten very popular and you can go to Korean grocery stores and you can find Korean restaurants in almost every corner. But even when I was in America from 2003 to 2011, you could not find any Korean grocery stores or Korean restaurants. In fact, my friends and I had to drive for four and a half hours all the way to go to Chicago to go to a Korean grocery market. And I'm sure that it was a lot more difficult to find a Korean grocery store in Arkansas in the 1980s. And so when Han Yeri starts to cry when she sees the food that her mother brought her, it's not just tears of happiness or being thankful. These tears are also tears of misery, tears of sorrow. She misses her home. She misses her family. She misses the life that she left when she left Korea. And all of these feelings are all just bubbling up all at once. But because Han Yeri's character is not the type who would actually verbalize what she feels, just the tears alone just really distills everything that her character was feeling. But it was Yoon Yeo-jung's response that really got to me. Yoon Yeo-jung was saying, like, why you're crying is just food. And she's actually smiling and she's happy and she's quite cheerful. But she's not actually being cheerful. She's forcing herself to sound cheerful because she knows that if she starts crying too, it's not going to help her daughter feel any better. And so already from the very first time that the mother and the daughter are together on screen, you know what kind of relationship they've got. It's a relationship of love where they don't necessarily verbalize everything that they're thinking, but through their actions and through the words that they say, you, you can actually tell that they care deeply for one another and want to protect each other as much as possible. And this is a very subtle and short scene, but as it turns out, Minari is one of those movies that doesn't really tell the audience what's going on. It expects the audience to just watch very quietly what's happening on screen and then think about what they just saw. And it's a very, it's a thinking person's movie. That's what I'm saying. Another scene that reminded me of my own grandmother was when the little boy who was portrayed by Andy Kim says to his sister that the grandmother can't even read. And when I saw that, yeah, that definitely reminded me of my paternal grandmother. 
When I was around 10 or 11, I was visiting my uh, paternal grandmother and a mailman had just come by and dropped a letter. And so I picked up the letter and I gave it to my grandmother. My grandfather was out of the house at the time. And she didn't even bother to look at the envelope. She just put it in a pocket and she said that she'd give it to her husband when he came home. And so I asked her, uh, aren't you even curious as to what there was in the letter? And that was when my grandmother told me that she was illiterate, that she had never learned to read or write. Now, I must have had a terrible poker face because as soon as she said that, she immediately explained to me why she never learned to read or write. Now, my grandmother grew up in the 1910s, and so she told me that at the time it was uh, unheard of for a girl to be taught how to read or write. It was unheard of for a girl to go to school, especially if we were talking about a lower income family. And so my grandmother never learned to read or write, but she also told me that she also had a Japanese name while growing up. And so as soon as I saw that Yoon Yeo Jung's character was someone who was quite illiterate, yeah, uh, I immediately pictured my grandmother. I immediately pictured Yoon Yeo Jung's character living in Korea during the Japanese occupation, not having gone to school, being forced to clean and cook from a young age. It was definitely part of another part of a Korean generation that not every Korean person is going to be able to recognize, especially when we talk about younger Koreans. Now, aside from the two leading female characters, I do want to address one more thing about this movie, and it's the, not the complete absence of, but the near absence of racism in this movie. Now, I did really appreciate the fact that this movie did not delve that deeply into racism. Now, it's not that I'm saying that I don't like stories that deal with racism. I think that's an important story that must be told, but not every story has to be about racism. And... There is a little bit of racism in this movie, but it's not mean. It's, uh, it comes from a well-intentioned place, and it really appears in the form of the children. Now, when the Yi family first attend the church, they, uh, the children come across um, similar age friends. And when the sister meets a similar age uh, friend who's also a girl, the white girl comes up to the, um, the little child and she says, hey, I'm going to speak to you in your language. And as soon as she says that, she starts saying ching chong or any of these kind of weird sounds that she's just randomly making. But you can tell that it's not her intent to offend. It's not her intent to um, to be mean to the girl. She's just trying her best to be friendly. But she just never had met an Asian person in her life. And she just doesn't know that what she's doing is offensive. And there's a bit of innocence to that. A similar thing happened with the boy. When the boy meets another friend who is similar to his age, the first thing that he asks is, uh, to the Korean boy is, why is your face so flat? Again, it's not coming from a place of meanness. It's just something that they're all genuinely curious about and they just don't really know what the politically correct way of uh, speaking to each other really is. After all, this is you know, rural Arkansas in the 1980s. It's not exactly the mecca of political correctness. And because this movie is not so much about racism, the problems that this family has to overcome are more personal in nature. They're about relationships with each other, about how much they're willing to sacrifice to achieve their goals and their dreams, about what it means to achieve the American dream is. It's about what it means to love one another and what it means to sacrifice for one another. It's, it's, a, much, it's a very family-oriented movie. And because of this, it's much more touching. It's much less about fighting the system and much more about what it means to be a family. And I think because of that element in this movie, it's just a much more touching movie. And by the time this movie had ended, I had cried like a little kid multiple times. And so, yeah, I do recommend this movie to a lot of people, especially if you've ever been an immigrant to yourself. I don't know if this movie might really speak to you because, again, the immigrant story that you might have experienced might be different from the one that you see on screen, but I'm sure that there are going to be some parallels that, you're not, that you might be able to relate to. This is a great movie. You can tell that it was a labor of love. You can tell that this movie was... Everything was crafted very carefully, and everyone should watch this movie, but be warned, you are going to cry probably, and so bring a box of Kleenex with you. All right, so that's the end of this video. If you liked it, click on like, subscribe, click on the notification bell, leave a comment if you want. I'd love to read your comments. I'm John Lee, and I'll see you all next time. Bye.